and in the hospital ecg was performed because he got admitted in the hospital due to shortness of breath and the doctors had decided to start the patient on rate control therapy rate control therapy metformin glycoside both for diabetes amlodipine uh, for blood pressure aspirin and atorvastatin for his coronary artery disorder but how digoxin will help in cardiac arrhythmias we all know that in heart failure we never use the calcium channel blockers A 70-year-old male, he got admitted in the hospital with the symptoms of shortness of breath, dyspnea, dizziness, lightheadedness, and palpitations. His medical history includes diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disorder. And in the hospital, ECG was performed because he got admitted in the hospital due to shortness of breath, dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitations, and the ECG was performed. And when the ECG was performed, the P-wave in the ECG was absent. He has been diagnosed with the atrial fibrillation. His heart rate, it went up to 200 to 400 beats per minute. And the doctors had decided to start the patient on rate control therapy, rate control medication. Okay. So this is the case scenario. Now let's see how in an easy way that we can learn this atrial fibrillation topic. Okay. So his current medications include because this patient has diabetes. So he's taking metformin one gram twice a day. Glycoside one daily for diabetes. Okay, so these two are for the diabetes. So which is not uh, much related to our current atrial fibrillation topic. And the patient is taking the penetopril five milligram one daily for hypertension. Okay, uh, that is the ACE inhibitor for hypertension. And as the patient had the CAD issue, the patient is taking the aspirin. And most of the patients, those who have the CAD problem, they also have the hypercholesterol condition. So the patient is also on the ADOVA statin. So these are the current medications that the patient is uh, on. Okay. Now let's have a look through what are the important observations or what are the important findings from the case scenario. The main symptoms the patient has been presented was shortness of breath, that is dyspnea, okay, dizziness, lightheadedness, and palpitations. So these are the symptoms uh, through which the patient presented to the hospital. And as we have seen that the patient has the diabetes, hypertension, CAD. Okay, so these are the three major uh, conditions are three major problems that the patient has and at the same time uh, his medications were he was taking metformin glycoside both for diabetes amlodipine uh, for blood pressure aspirin and atorvastatin for his coronary artery disorder and what are the main abnormalities the abnormality was observed in the ecg so what was the abnormality in the ecg the p wave was absent Okay, so here, if you have a look through this ECG uh, pattern, so usually ECGs, they consist of the P wave followed by Q, R, S, and P. E. Okay, so here there should be a P wave. After P wave, this is the Q, R, S complex, and this is the T wave. Okay. P wave is due to the atrial systole, that is atrial contraction, and Q, R, S, Q, R, S complex is due to the ventricular systole, that is ventricular contraction, and P e wave is due to the ventricular diastole, that is the ventricular relaxation. Okay. Atrial systole, then ventricular systole, then ventricular diastole. Okay. So atrial diastole is quite short, that usually it won't get recorded in the ECG of the heart. Okay. So here in the normal ECG, if you see the normal ECG, then here there should be a wave, okay, that is the P wave, then followed by this QRS complex and T, then P wave, QRS complex and T, P wave, QRS complex and T. Okay, so that's the normal pattern of the ECG. But what happened to our patient, our current patient? Okay? So our patient JK, when they took the ECG, there is no P wave. So here you can see the circles. So in the circles, there is no P wave. So the absence of the P wave is one of the characteristic features of atrial fibrillations. Okay? So absence of the P wave is one of the characteristic features of atrial fibrillation. Now let's have a look through what is meant by this atrial fibrillation and why this atrial fibrillation it occurs. So atrial fibrillation is a type of cardiac arrhythmias. Arrhythmias. The name itself it indicates that the rhythm, the normal rhythm has been changed. The normal rhythm of the heart has been changed. Okay? So the patient's heart rate, it will increase. It will go to tachycardia condition or the patient's heart rate, it may decrease. It may go into a bradycardia condition. So that phase is known as arrhythmia. Okay. So here we are mainly going to uh, discuss about the tachycardia, uh, that is the increase in the heart rate. Okay. 
so this tachycardia condition um we can categorize into or the arrhythmias in general we can categorize as the supraventricular and the ventricular arrhythmias ventricles so here you can see in this diagram the below two are the ventricles and the upper two are the atria okay. supraventricular means above the ventricles above the ventricles what we have we have the atria okay so we have the atria so atria is the uh, structure which is present above the ventricles and when it comes to the atrial abnormalities it will be as two types atrial flutters atrial fibrillations okay. and when it comes to the ventricular abnormalities it will be of two types ventricular flutters and ventricular fibrillations atrial flutter where the heart rate will increase up to 200 beats per minute that is the atria atria will beat up to 200 times per minute okay. ventricular flutter again 200 times per minute 200 to 250 but when it comes to the atrial fibrillations where the atria will beat up to 300 350 500 550 beats per minute okay so here there are a lot of things that are involved okay but now i'm not going to discuss about all those uh, things i'm going to put it as simple as possible okay so the arrhythmia may arise from the sa node usually sa node is considered as the pacemaker of the heart okay so because it is uh, considered as the pacemaker because uh, it it whenever the sa node uh, it generates the impulses because sa node has got the uh, capacity or it has the automaticity property where it can generate its own impulses and those impulses will travel to the AV node and from AV node the impulses will travel to the bundle of his and from bundle of his the impulses will travel to the Purkinje fibers and finally reach the ventricles as a result when the atria contracts first then followed by the ventricular contraction atrial contraction followed by the ventricular contraction so this is the normal pattern okay? but in case of atrial fibrillations what happens is instead of 80 beats per minute or 90 beats per minute here the atria is contracting up to 300 beats 350 beats 400 500 550 beats per minute okay so as long as the atria is in fibrillating condition the patient will develop some sort of the symptoms but there is no much harm to the patient like immediate uh, harm doesn't happen to the patient but when all those extra systoles when all those impulses it will travel through the av node and when it reaches to the bundle of his and finally reaches to the ventricle ventricular muscles then ventricles will start fibrillating ventricles will start at first flutters and then ventricle will start fibrillating if ventricle fibrillation occurs then there is a high risk of mortality okay ventricular fibrillation is a highly dangerous one so it is there is a high risk of mortality so here what's happening from the atria instead of 80 there are uh, 200 or 300 beats are generating so we need to control all those beats okay so all those beats they will travel only through the av node so we need to try something to block the av node okay so if we can block the av node then we can prevent the extra impulses reaching to the ventricles it means that we can protect our ventricles we can save our ventricles so this is the whole concept that is involved in the management of atrial fibrillation so there are two main methods that are involved to treat the atrial fibrillation one is the first one to protect the ventricles by blocking the av node and the second one to bring the normal rhythm of the heart back okay so the heart is in arrhythmic condition it is not in the sinus rhythm so what we need to do we need to bring the rhythm back to normal state okay. so these two are the main treatment measures that are that we use in atrial fibrillation okay so here i'm going to uh, discuss about uh, what are the medications that can be used for this uh, atrial fibrillation okay so flutters means the heart rate can go up to 200 or even up to 350 beats but fibrillation means where the heart rate will go beyond 300 it can cross up to 350 even up to 550 beats per minute so that's the difference between flutters and fibrillation so which one is highly dangerous fibrillation is highly dangerous so whenever the patient develops the atrial fibrillation that is the af then immediately what we need to do we must save we must try to protect our ventricles how we can protect our ventricles by blocking the av node so in order to treat this cardiac arrhythmias uh, wagon williams is the best classification so wagon williams uh, has made the classification okay so for all the anti-arrhythmic drugs and this is the best classification that we use uh, all over the world okay so uh, where they have classified the medications as class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 
class 1 again subdivided as 1a 1b 1c quinidine procainamide dis- disoparamide 1a 1b consists of lignocaine mexilitine and 1c consists of propafenone glycanide and canide class 2 are the beta blockers okay sotolol ismolol metoprolol all the beta blockers will come under class 2 class 3 are the agents which mainly prolong the action potential amiodarone dronidarone dofetilide epitilide sotolol okay, britilium all these are the class 3 agents and class 4 is the calcium channel blocker virapamil and diltiazem and apart from these four classes they have also included two other medications that is the adenosine and digoxin okay adenosine and digoxin for the treatment of uh, atrial fibrillations now so let's have a look through uh, which class of the medication are mainly used for uh, rate control because here we are discussing to control the heart rate to protect the ventricles okay so what measures that we can use so the main medications that we use are the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers okay so beta blockers and calcium channel blockers they mainly block the, when we give the beta blockers beta blockers will block the av node and prevents the entry of the excess impulses reaching to the ventricles so in this way by giving the beta blocker we can block the entry of the excess impulses to the ventricles okay and which means that we can protect the ventricles we can protect the ventricles uh, undergoing into ventricular flutters or ventricular fibrillations okay if beta blocker is contraindicated there are many um, contraindications for beta blockers so in case if the patient is not suitable for a beta blocker then what we can do we can also replace or we can go with the calcium channel blocker so the calcium channel blockers are two types dihydropyridine non dihydropyridine okay so if you want to know more about all these medications and so on i made a video on heart failure uh, topic okay so if you can uh, that is freely available on the youtube channel you, if you are interested you can go through uh, that topic okay, where you will come to know about all the classes of the medications that we commonly use in heart conditions different heart conditions so calcium channel blockers especially virapamil and diltiazem so these two are the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and these two calcium channel blockers can be used to block the av node okay so we can use the either beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker or the next last option is the digoxin so we can also use the digoxin so how digoxin will work because we have studied in your in our bachelor of pharmacy or in our pharmacy level we studied that digoxin is the main drug of choice in heart failure Okay. but how digoxin will help in cardiac arrhythmias so digoxin has two properties one is it will increase the force of contraction that is digoxin will increase the heart's force of contraction it has positive inotropic effect positive inotropic effect and at the same time digoxin also reduces the heart rate it mainly shows the action at the av node and it reduces the heart rate so in this way digoxin uh, can also be used to control the heart rate but in which condition we use the digoxin in case if patient has both the atrial fibrillation associated with heart failure symptoms if patient has both the atrial fibrillation associated with heart failure then the drug of choice is digoxin so here i mentioned what is the uh, atrial fibrillation management okay. so there are two methods one is the rate control method and other is the rhythm control so rate control can be done by beta blocker okay or calcium channel blocker or digoxin okay so usually the common drugs that we use is the beta blocker or we'll go with the calcium channel blocker when do we need to use the digoxin in case if the patient has the atrial fibrillation along with heart failure problem then the drug of choice is digoxin because we all know that in heart failure we never use the calcium channel blockers okay and uh, that's why the main drug of choice is the digoxin in if it is both the af with heart failure in order to control the uh, rate that is the heart rate okay that is the rate, rate control means it mainly controls the uh, it mainly prevents the ventricular flutters or ventricular fibrillations and in the management of the af there is also other main treatment so this is just to control the rate but the main treatment the main goal is to bring the rhythm to bring this arrhythmia back to the normal rhythm to bring the arrhythmic condition back into a normal rhythm in order to do so we can use the class 1c agents like glycanide encanide propafenone or we can use the class 3 agent like amiodarone amiodarone is a best drug for cardiac arrhythmias okay so amiodarone is the best drug for cardiac arrhythmias because amiodarone has got 
multiple uses. We can use the emitter room for atrial flutters, atrial fibrillations, ventricular flutters, ventricular fibrillations, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias. So in all the conditions, we can use the amio room. And also, in case if the patient has heart failure associated with atrial uh, fibrillations, then amiodarone is the main drug of uh, choice. Uh, it, it is not for the rate control, but mainly for the rhythm control, we go with the amiodarone. So these are the further application parts that we need to uh, know. So in some other day, if I got uh, some time, definitely I will organize another uh, session with you where I will explain you how the rhythm control medications that they act. Okay? But now I will end up this uh, uh, presentation session. Okay, So now, based on uh, this condition, now the doctor has decided to start the patient on a rate control medication. So which rate control medication that we can use? Okay? So which rate control medication that we can go now? Answers from your side, guys. Beta blockers. So what is? Yes, very good. So we can go with the beta blockers because always consider beta blockers as the first line drugs. If beta blockers are contraindicated, then we think about verapamil and tiltiasm. And digoxin, do we use digoxin in this case? No, never, because there's no heart failure symptoms. Okay? If the patient also has the heart failure symptoms, then we think about digoxin, but the patient doesn't have the heart failure symptoms, so we don't uh, think about digoxin at this stage. Okay, So we'll start with the beta blocker. If not, then go with the virapamil or diltiasm. But always remember, um, if patient is already on a beta blocker, never combine calcium channel blocker. If the patient is already on a calcium channel blocker, never combine the beta blocker. So if we combine both the beta blocker and calcium channel blocker together, then what happens? They both will block the AV node and leads to cause the severe bradycardia. Okay, So that's why we should never combine a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker together. 